Hi, I'm Sarah Luthwaite and I work on the Pedagogy of Methodological Learning project here at the National Centre for Research Methods. We're looking at how advanced social science research methods are taught and learned. In this short video, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges of reworking traditional class-based methods teaching material for video presentation. To do this, I'll be introducing some useful pedagogical concepts that you may want to explore before planning your video. I'm not going to discuss copyright of images or the ideal font size for your slides. That kind of information is available elsewhere. Instead, I want to focus on a few of the key issues that will inform your pedagogic decision making and instructional design. As video is a relatively new context for delivery, I'll also be talking about YouTube in light of educational, social media and accessibility research. And finally, because I have a lot of sympathy with post-structuralist accounts of learning and pedagogy, I'm going to start behind the scenes. So, let's begin with a look at what's going on here in what is a rather peculiar situation. As you can see, I'm standing in front of a green screen. I'm wearing a lapel mic and talking to a camera across the room. Behind the camera, John and Vim are watching and handling the technical side, and I'm reading a script I've written and rehearsed from a teleprompter. You can see I'm also holding this clicker that allows me to change slides on the teleprompter at a speed I'm comfortable with. This mode may not suit everyone. You may want to sit and you may want to have your notes closer at hand. All my slides will be added after recording when the video is edited in production. Note how they're repositioned so they work well on screen but also leave space for captions and subtitles below. We'll come back to that later. I'm showing you this to highlight the first issue that I want to mention. That is my immediate context right now as a teacher. This situation is thoroughly strange. Having access to studio and audio visual support is no doubt luxurious, but whether you're recording here or to a webcam, things do feel different. It's unsituated. That is, I don't have many of the referential cues of the classroom, the seminar, lab or the field. This is not lecture capture and there are no students here. This gives a certain freedom. I can introduce all sorts of new dynamic materials. We can cut away to examples of field work in the field. These are the cameras that we use to film short methods courses for our research. Both cameras are small, discrete, wide angle and film in HD. Generally we focus one on the teacher and one on the class. When the course is finished we run a focus group with the teacher and learners and use the video clips to stimulate reflection. We can produce a screen capture recording with a voiceover to guide the viewer through a particular technique with a software package or any other screen-based digital media. This software allows me to record from both cameras simultaneously or in turn. We record teaching sessions across a whole day and then use time-stamped field notes to identify moments of interest that we then show to the focus group. And so on and so on. These can be live action or animated, or you have to judge when you're creating one of these videos is the time and resource you're willing to commit to demonstrations. Of course, a lot of education is profoundly unsituated. It takes place away from the world. It is concerned with imparting or constructing knowledge that will be useful at another place at some point in the future. However, the experience of learning and teaching in this way is so embedded in our lives, we can forget the essential strangeness of it. Formal education is now such a common practice that it is thoroughly familiar with its own cultural conventions, expectations and norms. Abstracting the known student-teacher relationship through video, however, recomplicates this picture. Additionally, for those of us working within research methods teaching, where we find pedagogy is so often focused on learning by doing, experiential learning, and other problem-based or immersive approaches that strive to engage authentic data and real-world research, the unsituated aspect of standing in front of a camera and teaching through video may prove a particular challenge. So let's unpack this a little. When we consider our own teaching practices and pedagogies, many of the approaches that we have deployed and regularly use manage the interplay between our content on the one hand and our context on the other. Content may be a particular methodology and its associated characteristics concerning theory and the procedural and technical knowledge that express that theory in practice. Attention to context concerns how that content is best delivered for a certain group in a given learning environment. Shulman identifies this as pedagogic content knowledge, PCK. This is the intersection between general pedagogic knowledge, 
how to teach, and content knowledge, what is taught in a given situation. Given that PCK is so rooted in context and content, the notion of best practice itself is not necessarily very productive or useful here. In short, if I tell you what to do, I may be foreclosing on your teaching expertise and potentially limiting the multitude of ways in which you may choose to engage students through the specifics of your discipline, your method or your style. That's not to say we can't discuss the pedagogical decisions that are involved in approaching video as a learning resource. For example, when we teach advanced research methods, we often take explicit steps to get to know our students. We want to know who they are, what their methodological background is, what their research problems are, and significantly, what they want to get from our course. You might use introductions or take a poll on key terms to check understanding at the start of your class or have particular requirements that students have to meet before enrolling, but this is different. There's no class here. You won't have a strong sense of who the viewer is, just as I don't have a strong sense of who you are. With reference to social media, academics such as Dana Boyd and Michael Wesch call this context collapse. This refers to not a lack of context when broadcasting through video or social media, but the fact that all possible contexts are collapsed into one when we perform in networked publics. If you want a more in-depth and theorised account of context collapse, pause this video here and take a look at the supporting material tab associated with this video on the NCRM web pages. So, whilst online video offers massification and learning anytime, anywhere at the convenience of the learner, video also dislocates teachers and learners and potentially collapses the contexts that excellent teaching is attuned to. I can no longer check learner understanding, read body language for cues, engage in debate and so on. So, how can I know my imagined audience? At the start of this video, you may have noticed I tried to describe this video carefully. I was seeking to be upfront about what I was going to cover and at what level. The impetus is then on you as a viewer to self-select your way into or out of my audience. So, whilst on YouTube the discovery of learning materials and interaction with learning materials is self-directed and the teacher is removed, as Elaine Tan observes, learning decisions now reside with the student. Nonetheless, as we have seen, I can still actively model who I want to connect with and influence those learning decisions. There are also strategies I can employ when trying to engage my imagined audience, and forms of dialogue, in the Bactinian sense, are still possible. I can set you a task. I could ask you to review the first three minutes of this video and identify three explicit pedagogic moves that I've made. I could ask you questions and request that you pause the video to collect your answers. I could use rhetorical devices such as revoicing to repeat the kinds of questions that are asked during my teaching and then give answers. So, now I'm going to ask you to pause this video and take two minutes to consider two ways in which your video could engage viewers in tasks and activities. If you don't want to, take a comfort break or skip through to the next bit. And we're back. For those of us teaching in a dialogic, participatory, reciprocal way with lots of Q&A, we're going to need to tailor your approach. And if your teaching is more didactic, you can usefully consider what the affordances of video are to develop your teaching. Importantly, because my background is in accessibility and disability research, I'm also aware of the need for educators to exercise what Derrida calls radical hospitality. That is, to welcome not only those audiences that we project and expect, but also those that we cannot know and cannot expect. This video is going to YouTube and that carries with it all the collapsed contexts of the web. As you may know, Google own YouTube and as a result, YouTube video ranks highly in Google search. If you pick a good title, your video can travel. Also, I know if I speak clearly and at a steady pace without background noise, 
YouTube's also captioning will supply a reasonable set of captions for this talk. And then I can fix and check these later. This will be useful for deaf and hearing impaired viewers and some viewers for whom English is not their first or second language and those who are watching without sound for whatever reason. And because Google owns YouTube and Google Translate, it's worth noting that the captions that YouTube provides can then be automatically translated for non-Anglophone viewers with increasing accuracy into any one of 103 languages and counting. Lastly, captions and transcripts also improve search engine ranking. They are visible to search in a way that video content is not, and this will lead to more recommendations and visibility. So here's another task. If you haven't already, try switching on the captions for the remainder of this video by selecting the captions key below in the video player. Now, this isn't a sales pitch for Google, and it would be naive to suggest that auto-captioning and machine translation can account for cultural variation, exclusion, and somehow deliver universally accessible content. No. What I'm trying to do is highlight the shifting affordances of new digital media as a context in and of itself, and the potential spaces that these technical shifts can open up. As methods teachers, we are also methods learners. Our expertise are not static, and nor should they be. Mishra and Kohler argue that in the digital university, alongside pedagogic knowledge, we can and should acknowledge technology as a significant factor. They call this technological pedagogic content knowledge, TPCK. There are other ways to reflect upon technology and specifically video and its role in your teaching. However, if you want to read further on TPCK and consider how this might develop your teaching, return to the further reading tab above. So, I'm going to stop here. In this video, I've discussed context and learners and shown you my insider view on production. I've also gestured to potential modes of interaction through video. From here, I suggest you look at some of the materials I've linked to. Alongside material I've directly cited, I've also added more on the pedagogy of advanced methods teaching, including our quick guides, which are based on our ongoing research and related academic papers. Please do explore this reading list if this is literature that you are not familiar with. And please do get in touch if you know of work that I've missed. Thank you for your time.